Hi everyone, welcome to the Very Dow channel. I'm Lisa Davis, a volunteer at, with the Very Dow. Uh, today we have a roundtable discussion um, talking about the IPR uh, Interparties Partes Review, um, Coinbase versus Reggie Middleton. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick summary before we got started. On October 11th, 2023, a legal decision was filed from the Patent Trial and Appeal Board uh, regarding a petition by Coinbase to uh, initiate inter partes review board against a patent owned by Veritasium Inc. The patent in question number 1196566B2 discusses technology for facilitating low trust and zero trust value transfers, which enable parties with little or no trust in each other to conduct value transfer agreements mediated by a third party. The technology aims to reduce the need for costly third-party intermediaries traditionally required in such transactions. Coinbase challenged specific claims of the patent, arguing they are unpatentable based on prior art, particularly referencing uh, documents by Hearn, Armstrong, and Ziegler. Upon analysis, the PTAB finds that Coinbase's petition does not demonstrate a reasonable likelihood of providing at least one of the challenge claims unpatentable. The PTAB particularly points out that the terms and technicalities discussed in Hearn and Armstrong do not significantly correlate or to suggest the patent claims in this contention, as argued by Coinbase. Ultimately, the PTAB denies the institution of the PR, siding with Veritasium that the presented arguments and prior art by Coinbase do not significantly challenge the validity of the contested patent claims. Through this decision, Veritasium's patent claims stand as is. Coinbase's attempt to initiate a review against the patent claims is denied. So we're going to discuss that and more right after this. Hi, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I have um, a roundtable discussion today uh, discussing the IPR review on the claims. Um, of course, we have Reggie Middleton, the disruptor in chief, uh, founder of Veritasium Project, uh, multiple patent recipient, inventor of trustless sovereign finance, inventor of peer to peer capital markets, swaps, godfather of DeFi, TradeFi, CeFi, and dad at large. Um, welcome, Reggie. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we also have Bill Lagner. Bill Lagner is a graduate of the University of Florida with the BS in finance with honors. Um, he began in the investment industry in the late 80s, uh, initially as a stockbroker, then moved to the buy side at Fidelity. Bill was the first board member um, an outside investor of Uphold and founded Bearing Adventure. Uh, I'm sorry, Ventures in 2014, which invests in crypto infrastructure. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Thanks for having me. Uh, and to round up the roundtable, uh, Jonathan Olson, a registered patent attorney with Aon Law, specializing in patents and um, oh my goodness. Um, what did I get? Licensing um, those patents and uh, negotiating licensing. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School and a fellow patent holder himself for surface mount IC stacking, stacking method and device. Jonathan, you'll have to explain what that is <laughs> to all of us, but thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Um, so just to kind of get things started, I tried to give a quick summary at the beginning of the video to get everybody up to speed. But Reggie, can you give us some background on um, why the USPTO Interparties Review Challenge was uh, initiated by Coinbase or Armstrong? Um, it might help our audience kind of if you give a little backstory. Good idea. So quick background, uh, finance guy, tech nerd. Um, been, I've been doing things from an entrepreneurial perspective since I was 23 years old. Got into Bitcoin in 2013. I saw it as basically a network to exchange value based upon smart things, conditions, smart contracts. That was my 
aha moment in June of 2013, or July, June of 2013. As I was investigating, um, I created a company. I dropped my other business, which was investment and advisory. And I said, let's build something fantastic with this. Um, a partner who came aboard shortly thereafter by coming up with the idea of building something fancy was a uh, software engineer, very talented, um, Stanford, Amazon, Google, et cetera. But he was also a patent attorney, Columbia Law School trained, um, mm. several years under his belt. A software engineer plus patent attorney from, you know, this Silicon Valley area and Columbia Law very valuable partner to have. And we patented the ideas that I came up with and didn't think much of it. I thought it was a very good idea, but it's not as if the patent was a business. That was 2013, 2014. Fast forward now, almost 10 years. And as I see it, the business has grown and exploded, but more importantly, it's, it's being adopted by the mainstream which most people who practice in the business are not aware of. Uh, central banks are exercising what I will call decentralized fi finance widgets, just to be simple and oversimplifying it. Bits and pieces that plug in to what is traditional finance that use DeFi style technology. Central banks, such as the US Federal Reserve, um, central banks who are issuing uh, CBDCs, stable coins, bills of lading, um, swaps, uh, letters of credit, etc. All this is coming into the technology that a few people saw 10 years ago, or even earlier, Satoshi himself, but 16 years ago, I guess. So um, that's a quick background as to how I got into the space. Um, and started issuing in Japan. And then the U.S., they're allowed, they granted Japan and the U.S. And so we have multiple patents and we expect more. Um, and these patents are what I would consider foundational technology, the technology that industries have been built upon. So there are two basic type of patents to oversimplify. There are patents that, you know, um, claim to give ownership to a certain device, methodology, system, et cetera, that may never be used by anybody or maybe use a little bit of time. And then 0.1% of all the pants in the universe are so significant that they create trillion dollar opportunities. Um, the click now, buy now button um, for Jeff Bezos and Amazon, the page rank algorithm from MIT, I think, or Stanford, where they came from, but that's what Google was built on, uh, et cetera, et cetera, okay? I, who am a lay person, and I'm not as smart as many of these crypto, actually probably all the crypto guys and scientists, but I'm a good dad, I think. So that helps a little bit. Um, I believe non-scientifically, unscientifically, and not a lay, not a lawyer. So my non-scientific lay person's non-legal opinion is that what we've patented is foundational technology because it's a very specific, very technical patent that carries, covers a very small sliver of the space, but that small sliver is rested upon by multiple industries with the blockchain and crypto industry being one of many. Um, with the patent, I said, well, let's go and talk to people who are using it. Let's make licensing arrangements and I could continue to invent and create things and license it away and try to make the world a better place. But that's not really how things work in reality. In reality, uh, nobody wants to pay for something they didn't pay for before regardless of whether it belongs to them or not. Um, and I went to several companies uh, to try and discuss licensing or partnerships or ventures or deals. Uh, long story short, I was being disrespected, door stamped in my face, et cetera. So after about a year and a half, um, counsel said, you have to file suit. So we filed suit against Coinbase, Global, and Circle. Internet Financial Circle is the uh, fintech company that does a stablecoin USDC, and Coinbase is this country's largest native crypto exchange. Okay, and that's how we got to that point. Oh, yes, about the IPR. 
Um, legal counsel passed away unexpectedly. Um, I withdrew the lawsuits uh, without prejudice, which I'll always file again. Um, but Coinbase filed a petition for IPR review. Um, legal language for they want to invalidate the patent because they said that it was based upon prior art. In other words, it was an original. It's based on other people's work and other stuff that they said made the patent bad. Uh, we, I replied to that with help of a uh, very talented legal counsel. Um, I think it was like a six month review, roughly. And at the end of that six months or so, uh, the trial, patent trial and review, the patent trial and appeal board, which is like court inside of the USPTO, denied their petition for a trial. To be clear, they didn't go to trial and lose. They were denied the right to go to trial. The reason was they didn't have merits for a trial. The review board said, and I'm paraphrasing in layman's terms, it's a shame I got to put all these you know, <laughs> disclaimers in. All but, the disclaimers, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. In layman's terms, they're saying you don't have a chance of winning a trial, so we're not going to give you a trial. It's a waste of resources. And that implicitly, in my layman's opinion, significantly strengthens it. Uh, we gave three reasons why the trial shouldn't be granted. The review board agreed with all three reasons and even came up with a unique one of their own after going through the panel. That's a big, in my opinion, a big black eye uh, for the other side and a big win for us. Um, and there's more you know, interesting news coming down the pipeline, trust me. Uh, we find it very, very interesting. And it's um, a thumbs up for the entrepreneurs and the inventors, the small guys who actually, you know, invent things and create things and don't want to get mauled over by 20, 30, 40, 100 billion, trillion dollar companies. Um, and it shows that the system does work. Um, I've had experience where the system didn't work, or at least it worked for small guys like me. But this is an example of it actually working. Hopefully I answered your question because I did a lot of talking. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. Um, actually, I was doing some research on the um, the IPR uh, review board and some of the stats coming out of that. And there's not a lot that are um, upheld or supported through that. So uh, I think the significance of, of your patent being upheld through this, I think it is significant in my own opinion, but I'd love to get our uh, attorney on, on the uh, round table. Could you, uh, Jonathan, could you explain well, a little just, bit? Let me to... just jump in. I just want to comment on stats because yeah. stats are easy to misread and easy okay. to manipulate. Let's suppose there's a stat that says 50% of the outdoor petitions are upheld and they invalidate patents. That doesn't mean that 50% of patents are bad. What that means is that 50% of the big law firms or law firms that file the petition won. You don't file a petition unless you think you can get away with it. So if 50% of the petitions are upheld, that means that there's a 50% loss rate for filing, but that loss rate will go um, up significantly if all patents were filed. So okay. an another way of putting this is 80% um, uh, of people and 50% of people in car accidents have to go to the hospital. Okay. That doesn't mean that 50% of people have to go to, go the, hospital to the hospital because I you're sampling from people who have car accidents. Right. Okay, so there's a much higher proclivity of beginning hurt if you get in an accident. So there's a much higher proclivity of getting your patent invalidated if you go through a patent invalidation portal. That makes it even exponential to me. Um, I, Jonathan, um, can you explain a little bit about, um, does the denial of an IPR request strengthen a patent um, if so, we, I believe it is. Um, if so, can you tell us all the different ways that it might, um, including the estoppel effect or what is, uh, explain what the estoppel effect is and how that might, um, change things for Coinbase moving forward? Well, at the very least, uh, Coinbase is not going to be able to take the same art that they had before and file a new attempt to invalidate. Their options are severely, severely curtailed uh, by this. And it is a huge uh, black eye for Coinbase. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to keep myself calm, but <laughs> what you have done is uh, it's 
astounding in my in my world. It's, it's just wonderful because I see uh, so many fintech related uh, technology patents uh, getting harsh treatment at, at the patent office even before uh, and a an opponent uh, of the stature of Coinbase and their counsel uh, takes it on. So I am uh, my hat is off to you, Reggie. Uh, you are the man of the hour. And uh, as far as the uh, estoppel effects, it's true that IPR is only concerning art based rejections. That is to say, uh, <clears throat> anticipation and obviousness. And so uh, there's a, a possibility that something else could come into play in other in other procedures. But uh, I don't think that post grant review is available. I, I, I'm not. I, I guess I'm. I'm a little fuzzy on the corners of the of the situation as far as what uh, what Coinbase can do next. But uh, I would certainly suggest, if I were their counsel, that coming to the table and trying to trying to come to terms is prudent at this point. If they, if they can at all do so, large entities have a notorious ethic, and especially uh, management at lar of large entities have a notorious ethic for. Uh, disrespecting patents held by smaller entities, even, no matter how meritorious they may uh, they may appear. Uh, the large companies just don't. They, no no manager wants to say, say step up and say, well, let's pay them off. Let's 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 just pay the fare. We it's it's a it's a it's a kind of a a macho culture. I think it's fair to say that that makes them resistant even beyond the degree to which they a, a rational person would be. So, uh, but hopefully, uh, having cleared this hurdle, uh, we'll bring them back to the table. They have, a, you know, if if they can make if they can strike a a deal with Veritasium, there it's in their interest to do so. I, it it astounds me that they don't try to make a deal more often, a win win arrangement. Where this uh, patent, uh, who if they if they get a license for it, it, it serves as an obstacle to other players in the marketplace, but not to but not to Coinbase. So why would they not? If they if if you're open to doing that, if you're not looking to lock out the whole industry, which is your right as a patentee, but if you're if you're willing to uh, license it on fair and reasonable terms, I think they're I think it's uh, it would be a grave error for them not to try to make that deal with you. And on that note, I believe I'm a very re reasonable person. Veritasium is a very reasonable uh, operation. And, um, you know, a couple of things that slipped through the wayside. The prior art that they used came from Armstrong. Um, the basis, the basic one, or the primary prior art. Armstrong is the last name of the CEO and founder of Coinbase. So they used Brian Armstrong's patent which was filed a few weeks before mine was filed. But apparently it was a miss. Um, I don't want to get into details, but I believe our invention was significantly more um, uh, elegant, more complex, com complex, elegant than the Armstrong invention. Um, I am more than willing to license. The only reason we filed suit was we believe we weren't being listened to. Um, the... Uh, I'm trying to be as politically correct as possible. So I'm trying to avoid more lawsuits. Okay? Always a gentleman. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the reason why um, I think licensing would be a good idea is A, I'm more than amenable to it. And B, uh, they're bigger fish to fry. Look at Coinbase's position. They've lost about 80% of their share, plus 70% of their shareholder value since IPO, just two years ago and change. Very precarious position. And I think they'll be able to, you know, speak to that. They have been attacked by the SEC, as have I, kindred spirits. And I believe that the state SEC um, divisions are running amicus briefs to support them, which means I think if the federal Securities and Exchange uh, regulator makes any leeway, we expect states to follow in. Um, I personally, and I shouldn't speak up, but I have to on the principle, I won't come Coinbase's side on this. Coinbase, as I said, went public and did an IPO. I believe they laid out everything. 
I don't believe they disclose the risk of that infringement uh, adequately, but they apparently disclosed their whole business and the SEC allowed them to go public. Now the SEC is saying you are unlicensed and unregistered uh, securities exchange, you're breaking the law. Well, if that's the case, then why'd you allow them to break the law to go public? Mm-hmm. I definitely do understand Coinbase's perspective, and this is not a I hate them, me versus them. From a business perspective, if Coinbase manager is willing to listen and talk, let's jump in and do it. That's one less thing to worry about on your plate. It's my belief, personally, that these patents cover the vast majority of Coinbase's revenue, the vast majority, as in well over 50%, well over 60 or 70%. My personal opinion, non-professional, non-legal. More than you know, more than a reason to sit down and have a conversation. Absolutely. Um, so, with that said, uh, Bill, I wanted to um, get your thoughts on this as someone in, uh, with a great history in the investor space, as well as someone familiar with doing due diligence on uh, the five six six patents and Veritasium business model. Um, how does this decision affect the way you see Veritasium? patents and Reggie's uh, place in future finance? Well, I, I, I think, number one, it's material, right? And so an 8K filing would probably be the least that they could do, right? Within, I think it's four or five business days. Um, it's material. It should be disclosed to their shareholders. And, um, and look, I mean, there's there's probably other parts of their business that have different types of risks in addition to the patents that uh, that they're not disclosing. I mean, I've gone through some of their filings. I I, um, I remember going through the original uh, public offering documents, and you know, there were quite a bit of disclosures, by the way, in there. Not nothing related to patents, but along the lines of what Reggie just articulated around the. the um, whether or not those those instruments they were selling were securities, but yeah, I think I think the 8K is a, is a minimal requirement on their part. Now, granted, look, I know they're dealing with the SEC. There may be other lawsuits. I haven't looked at their filings lately, as I said, but um, but this is material, and um, and it should be disclosed to to their investors. Well, and we're going to, well, we might as well jump right into the disclosure discussion. Um, we're, both, we're all kind of leaning that way um, because there are, there is this wave of investors. I think I heard um, that more than 65% of Americans are now dipping their toe into the crypto market and investing for themselves. Um, and, um, so this 8K that you're speaking of, I'd never, I hadn't heard the four to five days. I don't know the details on it, but one of the documents I was reading was very um, contradicting itself. One minute it was saying, you know, uh, that that uh, businesses could be held, owners of businesses could even be held criminally liable for not disclosing uh, to their investors uh, risks of patent infringement. Then in the next breath, they were saying, well, they could cover it under a generalized blanket uh, statement. And um, then it went back to this 10K and 8K. And um, Bill, can you give us a little more information about those disclosures and how um, people, because Coinbase, like we just wrapped up Q3 um, and I know Coinbase did like a letter to their shareholders. I saw a little tweet with lots of pretty little infographics and all this. I didn't see anything on there about patent risk or um, risk of infringement. And we know that this IPR was filed on October 11th. Yeah. So let me give you a couple stories um, in my life and because maybe this will help get back to what you're asking. And I was a large shareholder of a very large software company 20 years ago, and they had one of the top four or five accounting firms. They were and they were doing maybe three quarters of a billion dollars a year in revenue. They changed the method by which they recognize revenue from sell through to sell in. Sell through is if you're selling to distributors, you can't recognize that particular revenue stream until they sell it to their end customers. But they changed the revenue recognition methodology and never, that's material, and never informed anyone. And then a whole slew of bad things happened after that. And we we opted out of the um, class action. We sued 
the board members. Uh, we put the CEO and the CFO in jail. Um, it was it was it was one of the most famous uh, fraud cases actually on the Nasdaq. That was 20 years ago. And then you had the Enron situation, right? And then you had Sarbanes Oxley and the the various uh, requirements of executives when they're signing off on financials before they're released either to the SEC in a filing and or the shareholders. Uh, and then the various repercussions, right? If you're publishing um, erroneous financial information, knowingly publishing erroneous uh, financial information. And then f- from that, you know, and how Reggie and I met years ago, you had financial companies creating off balance sheet entities, st- structured finance, you know, the whole thing and not really uh, quantifying the risks and reporting those risks to their respective shareholders. And then we saw what happened after the financial bubble burst in 09. So all of these are, are quote unquote risks and they're all important and they all have various consequences, right? I think I just touched on a few of those. Sure. And, and the patent piece as it re- relates to Coinbase is, uh, I think it's like 80% of their business. I haven't gone through all their, their different business lines. I was just looking at their numbers actually the other day. But, um, but this is material, and so this, this should be filed, and the shareholders should know about this. It just seems, uh, yeah, really interesting. Um, so, Jonathan, um, do you see um, this kind of clearing the way? This, does this, is this a win for Reggie overall, and does this clear the way for him um, to <laughs> pursue other parties that might be infringing on the 5 to 6 patent um or do you see other hurdles still to overcome well each new party he approaches uh has the capability of dredging up their own art for perhaps uh opposing your patent and other bases so uh it it would be great if you could resolve the ones that you have in front of you before you uh get spread too thin and, and at least give them a moment to assess their situation now and, and determine and decide whether uh, it's safe for them not to highlight what's going on to their shareholders or if they do share what's going on, you know, to, to what degree they share the significance of it. I've heard of many instances where what they're doing at the time in terms of disclosure seemed adequate, but in the cold, hard light of day from a from a shareholder lawsuit, uh, reasonable decisions may be scrutinized more than uh, one would anticipate. So I, I really hope uh, a deal can be struck. I, I think there there are risks from having a huge number of uh, adversaries at once. Uh, so you know different different players in Reggie's position might uh, try different things, but. Uh, I guess in, in this case, I, I, uh, I anticipate that he enjoys in particular a, an opportunity to license. Maybe, he, maybe there are uh, friendly opportunities yeah. for licensing third parties to, to fill up the coffers and add credibility uh, and, and give uh, some other entities in the marketplace uh, a sense that they are getting in while the getting is good. Whereas when, once you, you know, you have, uh, to the degree that you're not licensing in a discriminatory matter, manner, I think there are opportunities to make a make a kind of a golden opportunity purchase at this point for some other entity that would benefit from your technology, even while you're negotiating with Coinbase on a, on a if if you approach them on a friendly basis, offer with an offer to license, for example, as contrasted with a cease and desist letter. To be the first seat at the table kind sure, of thing sure. and really looking out for their shareholders. Um, absolutely. There was, um, where was that question? Reggie, what are your thoughts on some of that? Where are you with that? Okay. Well, I'm friendly and you know, <laughs> hopefully everybody who works with me is friendly. Actually, hopefully everybody will be friendly. Um, the only people that make money in lawsuits or lawyers it's you know you know and you love lawyers as much as the next guy with you know jonathan no offense but you know we're necessarily the most most loved profession okay (laughs) but um 
I do understand where Coinbase is coming from. Yeah. Um, this is how I see it. Uh, two, four, I'm going to comment on negotiation versus litigation. And then I want to comment on the investor perspective. Um, I go in and say, um, give me uh, $150 million and you can use the patent a year. Just picking a number just out of thin air, okay? Uh, now, Coinbase, when Bitcoin is going up, is capable of doing six, seven billion dollars a year. So that is basically just hiring another CEO or two. You know, honestly, that's not a, that's actually not a lot of speed. So Coinbase has four or five thousand employees. Add two more employees, you have the license fee for one year. So it's not really a big deal in terms of expense. Yet, um, on the risk side. If the vast majority, if I'm right, and the vast majority of the revenue derives from the patent, there is risk there. So just taking the risk and uncertainty out, the management um, attention diversion out is worth it. It's just 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 like hiring two more employees, high, you know, high ranked employees, two more. You take instability or uncertainty out. Any investor, and Bill could tell you, uh, stocks value is revenue stream minus expenses discounted by uncertainty for the future. You decrease the uncertainty, you increase the valuation based upon the same amount of revenue or earnings. Number one, um, lawyers think differently. Lawyers say, hey, this guy wants $150 million. This kind of, in fact, is only the price of two CEOs because the lawyers that were going to say that. He'll say, listen, give me $5 million right, which is, what, 3% of what he's asking, and um, I'll see if I can knock it out. And uh, manager would say, hey, well, that makes sense. I can put 3% in um, as a call option, you know, to see if, we, you know, we hit pay dirt. The problem is you still have to go through the uncertainty, management distraction, and if you lose, if you lose, do you have to pay punitive damages, treble payout. So now that 150 becomes 450, um, et cetera, et cetera. You are now diverting yourself against patent suit where your business act relies on it, plus fighting the SEC, maybe the CFTC, all 50 states. From my perspective, it's not worth it. But obviously, they are not me and I'm not them. Th those are different ways to look at it. The numbers that I chose have nothing to do with whether I would license or not. Those are not real numbers. Those are just nominal figures I'm pulling out to have the discussion. So I don't want anybody to say, you know, Reggie says X, Y, and Z. Those are just numbers. It could have been one million. It could have been a billion. I'm just can I, can I, I want to add something to what, what Reggie just said, because I, I just thought about this. So, and Jonathan kind of painted the, painted the picture. You, you've got all these different groups out there, especially overseas where there's a lot more regulatory clarity, talking about tokenizing real world assets. You know, pick the country, whether it's Japan, Switzerland, EU, UK. There's 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 kind of a blueprint now, a pathway to, you know, all of this kind of unfolding, the real opportunities within blockchain technology as it relates to real world use cases, as opposed to, you know, much of this, which is just speculation thus far, in my opinion. And so, what happens is, you know, by Coinbase or or maybe Circle or some of these other groups, let's say they decide to dig in their heels and other groups decide to come to Reggie and license his, his patents, they become first to market in tokenizing X, Y, or Z. And this is, this is, we're still, I mean, I know this industry is whatever, 15 years old with the birth of Bitcoin, but it's still early in terms of like global adoption, right? Most people have just been, you know, speculating and trying different things, seeing what works, what doesn't. We're, I think we're now entering like this 1997 moment, the internet, where the FCC decided to, under Clinton, create a lot of clarity around different types of protocols, you know, for email, uh, web pages, et cetera. And then uh, all of a sudden the internet took off and all the applications got built on it, et cetera. I think we're at that moment in time now. So What's interesting, if you're Coinbase, because they're, let's face it, they're the first mover, right, in terms of the space. And they've got, I don't know what percentage of the total wallets they have. It's got to be enormous. You know, they run a very significant risk um, just from a commercial standpoint, right, of just losing out to others that come late but decide to work 
with Reggie and others that have patents and actually build real world use cases. Exactly. You, know, you have a conservative family office who is, you know, been in operation seven generations. Okay, five generations, not super, or even three generations. They have a few hundred million dollars. They say, hey, um, I'd like to come on as a client. Coinbase is embroiled in a patent litigation suit, a serious one, and Bill Crypto Exchange is not. And say, hey, we licensed it. There is no infringement risk here. What would a conservative client go with? It's a right. no-brainer, assuming Bill passes due diligence with finances, reserves, etc. cetera. You know, again, fighting, and maybe it's because I don't like to fight, but fighting is a bad business decision, right? Unless the other side is being untenable and unreasonable, it's a bad business decision. But that's neither here nor there. And I want to repeat again, I was pulling numbers just out of the air. Those numbers have no significance in terms of anything except for me being able to finish the conversation. Okay, so 150, 100, 1 billion, just normal numbers. Now to move on to the investor part of it. Again, I'm not a lawyer, right? But I have invested in a couple of things in my life and I am a very, very strong um, analytical person, fundamental analysis, global macro, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm better than the average. Um, as I understand it, under the duty of care um, requirements, the threshold for whether you should report a risk would be whether the investor feels it's material, not the management. You know, management can say we feel the same material risk and they can put it there. And I think they get away with that unless investors come up and say we felt that was a material risk and we felt it should have been reported. If I was management or management's counsel, not legal counsel, just simple business advisory, I would have to put myself in an investor's shoe to see what the investor thinks. So if you are an investor and XYZ public company, let's not go on point this, XYZ public company, and that company was sued for patent infringement with a long list of patent you know, infringement claims. Um, and then XYZ company attempted to invalidate the patent office and it was shot down without even giving a trial because they couldn't come close to even showing a likelihood of invalidating the patent. Would you want to know about that if you invested a significant amount of money in that XYZ company? I'm asking everybody on the board just out of curiosity. Bill, why don't we start with you? Um, I would. That was one of my question was, uh, was something along those lines was talking about the um, Will this decision affect the way that companies and investors uh, assess material risk going forward in their business? Yeah, look, I mean, I, 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 I think the last, I don't know, the last, and I've met a lot of characters in the space, uh, the last three years, I mean, most of these companies I was talking about, I knew they weren't going to make it. You know, Celsius, BlockFi, those were just rehypothecation examples. Uh, in the case of FTX, it was just absolute embezzlement fraud, right, from, from the word go. Uh, it, it is kind of interesting how little diligence was done by many of these investors. I think that whole, you know, fast and loose and, and apathy from the investment standpoint, that pendulum is going back the other way. I think people are going to scrutinize everything now. And, and you know, the risks, obviously, the regulatory risks, and then with regards to patents and then just, you know, the ability to execute and, and so on. But yeah, I, I, I think that smart management and here's the other challenge. And I don't know all the different people at, at Coinbase. When I meet most of the people that run these different companies and I've invested in some of them, they're young people, they're wildly naive and they're real sloppy. I mean, they've never run, they've never run a business, let alone a, a either a public company in the case of Coinbase or in the case of these other examples, they were, they were relatively decent sized businesses, you know, 100, 2, 3, 400 million dollar year businesses. So in, in most of those cases, it was poor management. Again, I don't know the different managed C-suite people at, at Coinbase, but sure. I mean, I, I think when you're, when you're running a public company and you're running a private company, there's, there's, there's uh, similarities and there's, there's some differences, right? In terms of what you're forced to report by, by various groups. In the case of Coinbase, it's a U.S. company, SEC, right, uh, registered company. 
they they should be with all the litigation that's going on in the industry right now they should be doing everything imaginable right to try and quantify and limit risk i mean that's what i would do i mean when when you've got transparent as possible yeah yeah you've, you've got an industry that was you know screaming transparency years ago and all i saw was massive opaqueness with most of these companies and yet you know now this company is public company it's a big company three billion dollar a year roughly company you would think they would at a board i don't even know who's on their board but the board members right it's their responsibility and the c-suite to look at these risks quantify these risks and disclose these risks uh, i think well, uh, Jonathan, I know your company, your firm specializes in negotiating uh, licensing. So I'm curious what your response is on this. Well, uh, as far as your negotiations with them, uh, Reggie, I, I would think that it, it might take a while. They, they may not act right away, but uh, I do see a lot of uh, vulnerability in their, in their position if they choose not to disclose. I mean, they, they, it might be a fairly dry and brief disclosure. Uh, our, IPI, our IPR uh, petitions, petition was denied. It can be, it can be reported in a, in a dry manner. <laughs> but uh, at some point, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to envision uh, them being brazen enough to think that their shareholders don't need to hear any notification because there is no risk and uh, we and, and, and we're willing to take the to face a future in which uh, we, we say we say, well, we didn't tell you because there was no risk, but nevertheless, that's what happened. That's that's just an untenable position later on uh, for them to put themselves. If they have a long term mentality at all, uh, then some disclosure will be would be expected. I haven't read that Q3, but I'd be willing to do a pinky bit on that. <laughs> you think they won't? You think they will? I think they won't. I scanned um, through it I, uh, I quickly, and I am no expert in financial or legal matters at all, and I didn't see a darn thing. So, huh. um, yeah, I'd love uh, for someone to point that out if they are able to find that risk uh, disclosed. I, I mean, look at it from a risk perspective. Um not me, let's use somebody else, because I, I don't want to, it's very difficult for me to talk um, since there's potential litigation. So somebody else, um, Richard, Richard Littleton, sounds like me, right? <laughs> Richard Littleton has a patent um, to this company, right? Withdraw the lawsuit because of unforeseen circumstances, right? Survived and clearly knocked out of the ball of the IPR. And to put in the perspective the IPR, um, you know, this was prosecuted with the patent office for six, six and a half years. The patent office didn't do this easily. We really had to fight, wrestle, scream, and yell, and convince, or finally convince them to give it. Um, Coinbase was represented by Quinn Emanuel, one of the biggest litigators in the country, for litigation. And they chose Perkins Cooley, which I believe has the largest patent attorney bench in the country. 499 patent attorneys at my last glance a few months ago. That's, you know, and that's 499 attorneys just for doing patent work. So Big Goliath goes up to David. They were thoroughly denied and clearly denied, um, which sends a message. Let's suppose Richard Littleton sues them again because he can sue them at any time since they withdrew without prejudice. Okay. But before he sues them, he gets another patent issue. And the other patent is now broader than the first patent. And if I'm not mistaken, and I'm a lay person, not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice, it's just what I might have heard. Or and all theoretical. Said, right? That um, it is too late for Coinbase to bring another IPR. Okay? Because they lost the other one and they didn't have time to bring one since the, they were sued. So now they can't invalidate the patent at the patent office. They have to try it at court which would be difficult because, you know, the other side thinks we could say, well, the patent office already decided this twice, Your Honor. Let's move past. Assuming that works, assuming that works, and again, I'm not a lawyer, Coinbase is forced to litigate on their merits, meaning that they have to prove they're not infringing. Patent suits, as I understand it, again, when more disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, they can take a long time with big companies because big companies can draw them out. But these are companies with a lot of 
proprietary internal technology. The Microsofts and the Mercs and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Coinbase is using open source technology. You can find out what they're using by going to GitHub. You know, you could go to GitHub, pull down an Ethereum code, and if they're running an Ethereum validator pool, you can see exactly what they're using. No advanced discovery stretched out for years. You know, the few minutes it takes to pull the GitHub down and put it into a chart. So there's again, you know, something that's different in this industry than others. And there's a lot of reason to negotiate and there's a lot of risk in not negotiating. Now, of course, I'm probably very biased. So outside of not being a lawyer and not being as smart as everybody else, I may be biased as well. I want everybody to keep that in consideration, take that in consideration. Absolutely. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, do you have any feedback on that? On I, have a, I, have a, I have a couple of things that, that kind of leap out at me that other folks okay. might not see just because of the, thing, the, the world I live in. Um, <clears throat> you say that uh, a lot of their revenue might be impacted by this, by the claims of this patent. And the claims are uh, long and complex, even though I'm familiar with this uh, technology. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have time just to pre in preparing for this uh, to assess how much, how, how broad the revenue of, of uh, their revenue is that might be affected by this. And I don't know their products all that well, uh, but they thought enough of it uh, to file this, uh, the IPR. And uh, that's not a small, that, that's not something you do if, if, if you have a, a slam dunk design around. So if they had the, if, if, if they thought not, none of their revenue was impacted, if they thought that, that it would be easy for them to adjust so that they're not infringing, IPR, I, I would advise against doing the IPR. It's, it's uh, somewhat risky. They could end up in a fact pattern like we're in and uh, costly. Uh, another thing that, another halo that uh, causes me to marvel at uh, where you are, and I'm, I'm not at all surprised to hear that your uh, co-inventor was has uh, patent law background. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Uh, I look at the uh, term extension. I was looking at the cover page of this patent. It's, uh, it was extended by, uh, ter term was extended by 550 days. So a little over a year and a half. And what that tells me is that uh, when you first started, you had claims and, you know, we were, you were seeking claims of a certain kind and that after starting to negotiate, negotiate with the examiner, you adjusted them to try to find something that the, he would find uh, agreeable. But for the last four and a half years, you have held the line. You're, you're, you've been pursuing essentially the same claims, trying to, trying to, trying to come to terms with the examiner and, uh, and the examine the other the, all of the examiners that that worked on it at the patent office, uh, and they sided with you, not with their examiner. Not they, they, so you uh, did make adjustments early in your patenting process, but not thereafter. And so um, it, I, I just continue to marvel at what you've achieved here. This I, I was telling uh, Lisa before you got on that this patent smells like brimstone. Uh, <laughs> when, when, so. Uh, let me let me back up. Uh, pat patents are a monopoly, uh, which is a social evil usually, but they're protected by the Constitution because we want inventors to uh, develop their ideas and we want them to disclose their ideas and to entice them to do that and to teach their recipes like you have. Uh, we make this exceptional society has has for a long time had had these exceptional artificial monopolies created. So that so the fact that you developed and the fact that you taught your idea clearly uh, and for all to see the word patent means open. So that that's your halo, and and the brighter your halo, the cooler the idea is, the clearer you've made it, uh, and the more you stick to your guns in terms of the, these are the claims we want. Patent office, please grant these. Please, you know, and and you just stuck to your guns for four and a half years before this, before we we got to today. I mean, I guess it, it, uh, I'm. It, I'm thinking now. I'm speaking in terms of the date of issue, but four and a half years from your last significant claim changes to the grant date. Yeah, seven before that. Yeah. So, so, uh, <clears throat> so this is. It, I mean, I, I think it's just. Uh, 
you're 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 following the recipe, and I'm I'm so glad that someone like you wins. I wish I could always uh, succeed when I have a worthy client like you. Uh, often we do, but not always. And so, props to you. I'm so I'm I'm totally a, a fan from day one. It's good to have somebody appreciate it. I can't discuss what I have to go through behind the scenes, but I have been attacked. My children. Well, I, I'm not your I'm attacked. not your counsel. I'm I'm some I'm some other guy just just watching and 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 you know your you you and your patent counsel are uh, Batman. Just amazing, <laughs> amazing. It smells Thank like you. brimstone because you had to go through one of the harder par parts of the patent office. I would say maybe this is seventh circle of hell stuff. You, that's where you go if you want to get this kind of coverage. They're, they're going to put up some resistance. So that it, part I expected. Victory is what's uh, what, what's interesting about your case. Thank you. I mean, I've had government agencies say that I was a fraud for saying I had valuable patent applications. And had entities say that I was a fraud for saying I would get them granted. Said I was a fraud because they will cover a large addressable market. Yep. And I was wrong about that because they cover a much, much larger addressable market. But um, it's good to hear, you know, to get the validation. Thank you. And this is a patent attorney who knows what he's talking about. So how come none of the media companies, Coindesk, exactly. Cointelegraph, Fortune, I can name a whole bunch of them. Nobody mentions it. They That's mention true, it right? Someone I, said something negative. I was well, going Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. A Aeon and I have had uh, great success in blockchain. So yes, I mean, I there isn't anything in your application I can't read and understand with in detail, and uh, and so you know, I, if if you came to me with this invention, I would I would have to I would, I would warn you on day one. We couldn't we could encounter a good amount of resistance. Just brace yourself for that. But uh, you, 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 you came through the, the, the hard part of the journey, the hardest part of the journey that I'm familiar with uh, uh, is, is behind you. So props. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I do a lot. A good amount of resistance is the understatement oh, sure. of the year. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, you, you've won the battle. This is a war. Okay. But listen, I heard that Thomas, uh, uh, the guy that patented the improvement to telegraphy, telegraphy, um, encountered almost 600 challenges to his pain. That wow. guy's name was Alexander Graham Bell. 560 mm. something challenges, fought each and every one of them to a standstill and defeated all of them. And the, the result was, he, you know, invented telephone and patents and control communications. And by the way, communications are significant in this country. Uh, just to handle the patent troll, let me just address. Pet trolls too. I don't want to dominate the conversation. I'll be quiet after this. But, no, I loved you know, it. it, it, it does, I know, heard I your I heard your comment about renaming, uh, reframing patent trolls to patent pirates. So I'd love to yeah. hear your and, thoughts and on patent that. pirates are actually a term. they're actually a real thing. Right. It's just that it's not heard in the media because the media is owned by patent pirates. But that's right. The um, or at least the crypto media, the term patent troll basically describes what I believe, and again, I'm not a lawyer, a non-practicing entity. So an entity who buys up patents just to sue people. An inventor can't be a patent troll because in order to invent it, you had to reduce it to practice or you had to make it or use it or invent it. If you invented it, you can't say that you never use it because the invention itself is a use or a reduction of practice. You cannot be a patent troll if you sue somebody for not using your invention, it's your invention. Uh, a patent pirate is an entity who steals the inventions of smaller entities, entrepreneurs, etc., and refuses to license it because they're bigger, they're stronger, they have more money. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's theft. Mm -hmm. So instead of discussing patent trolls, we should be looking at the pirate, the Caribbean type guy with the eye patch. But unfortunately, patent pirates are not that charismatic guy that played in that movie. There are people who, or entities, not people, who run roughshod through the lives of entrepreneurs and inventors, which is the lifeblood of this country. That's why this country it has the largest economy, because it created the strongest patent system, and it encouraged invention and encouraged small guys to try to become big guys. Okay, off my soapbox. I, I, I was just gonna, error in 
Go ahead, Lou. Lou's definition. You correct me, Jonathan. I, I was going to add one more before you got to the pirates, which I love, by the way, um, and the, the current blockchain media folks. You know, when they're all, quote, unquote, attacking Reggie over the last, you know, whatever number of years, you know, take a look at who the attackers are. Let, let's just let's separate the media folks from just the, the quote unquote economic actors in the space. And uh, I've been I can't I've lost count of how many conferences I've been to, and how many people I've met. Most of these people are just complete characters. I mean, they'll they've never run a business. They wouldn't know how to run a business. And and they're just hanging around and grasping at straws. Well, they're the ones firing arrows. You know, you got to consider you know, consider who you're dealing with here. So you really, I, I actually think this is a, a great time because with all the things happening with Digital Currency Group and the scandals there around Genesis and so forth, like all of these bad actors are being exposed. Um, they're going to have their various consequences, not, not just what happened with FTX recently, but all these groups. And that will, that will ultimately... Uh, clear out a lot of the noise and debris and the bar will be raised and then you'll actually uh, get a, a better set of kind of innovators and business people and entrepreneurs entering the fray. That, that's kind of, and it happened with the internet. It's, it's the same thing's going to happen here. It's time for crypto to grow up. And yeah, that's, the table. that's right. yeah. yeah. And there is a huge education piece in it. I love that, um, you know, Jonathan uh, brought up that patents actually mean open you know, when we hear COPA pushing their idea of, uh, you know, uh, their idea of open, which seems to be some double speak there. And instead, patents are really what's open. Um, so everybody do your research, um, connect with people like Bill, like Jonathan and like Reggie to get uh, the real story about what's going on and to protect yourself um, if you're an investor. And make sure you get all those disclosures. Um, before we close, I wanted to get um, kind of all of your uh, closing thoughts on. I, I saw, I was out doing my research today and saw that um, that there may be a uh, suit being brought against Circle um, from Veritasium today. I don't know that Reggie can speak on it much, but um, I'm wondering as an investor, Bill, what would that... Uh, how would that uh, appear to you for how would you advise your investors? Well, I, you know, I, I remember looking at circle years. Someone asked me to invest in circle years ago and I looked at it and I couldn't get comfortable. This is, this is many years ago when they first began well before they, they tried to, well, well before they created USDC, which was dollar on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, I haven't seen the lawsuit. Um, I know that, I believe they were trying to go public through a SPAC. Reggie made comment on that a couple of years ago, 18 months ago or so. And, and, and I've also looked a little bit at their business model and how much counterparty risks they, they have. I, I haven't looked at the lawsuit today. So uh, uh, sorry about that. I caught you a little off guard there. Um, there's you, also some news coming that. out um, just in the last caught few me off guard days. too. <laughs> in the last few days that HSBC is tokenizing gold. So I wonder if those two things go hand in hand. Um, the timing of this seems to be um, just perfect. So maybe a little bit of brimstone in that too. Jonathan, what are your thoughts? I would just like to express a hope that these business CEO things resolve and so that uh, you and your co-inventor can get back to the business of creating because there is so much that can be built on the blockchain and with smart contracts uh, in terms of uh, basically computer programs replacing litigation because they're mm -hmm. so beautifully unambiguous and uh, flexible once you have the missed mastery to configure them. But to productize that and, and, and get it out there in a, in a way that a market can understand so that uh, all, these play, all these parties can win uh, is something that I, I would love to see happen. And if you, if you come to Seattle, uh, let's talk about the, the future of blockchain, Reggie. Okay, I'll take you up on that. Um, we're inventing stuff right now, and I get the feeling there's going to be some strong news coming out. Very, very strong news. Feeling like it. 
you hinted about that um and and you did say uh in a recent interview that you're not a litigious man and prefer to people to come to you um so reggie can you kind of wrap us up um with some with some final thoughts of, of where you see this going okay well first i want to say that um i do not believe there's a veritasement lawsuit that has been filed so oh um, okay let me put that to bed but also, Maybe I will I'm not a... speak on oh. extent litigation. It's no upside for me. Um, I won't speak on claims in a patent. No upside for me. All downside. So I have enough problems as it is without <laughs> bringing guaranteed losses to my doorstep. Um, but wrapping this up, um, I'd like to rehash a point I made before. I understand this is most of the practitioners in the space or um, open source developers and engineers and um, who don't really understand how the patent process works may be anti-patent, but you can't be anti-IP and pro-open source because in order to open source something and enforce the open source nature of that something, you have to own the IP, license it, and enforce that license, even if it's an open source license. So let's say there's a, you know, Bill University or Jonathan University uh, open source license that says all this code is free. You can do whatever you want with it. But if you modify it or make money on something that you did to change it, you have to contribute it back to the community. In order to enforce that, you have to own the IP or you can't enforce it. And so an enforced open source patent is an expression of IP ownership. And so if you're pro open source, you're pro IP ownership by definition. Does that sound correct to you, Jonathan? I think so. I think okay. so. It's an excellent point. Yeah. And yeah. number two is um, the blockchain crypto slash blockchain slash DLT slash distributed value transfer industry is the only industry in my life that I have seen. And I dig into, you know, I have a team of analysts and we dig in, we've been digging into the fine print for 18 years now and it's the only 16 years and it's the only industry that i know of that totally ignores patents and ip tens hundreds of billions of dollars have been put into here and nobody bothered to look to see if any of this stuff was owned or patented by anybody could you imagine building a semiconductor fab and getting one or two billion dollars worth or 100 million dollars worth of investment and not even checking to see if the chip or the fabrication process was patented or biopharmaceuticals or anything. Anything that requires technology, the basic due diligence is to see if the guy owns the technology or to see if somebody else owns it. Nobody ever checks. The amount of risk floating around, floating around in the DOT space are significant. You know, and it, I've looked at it, and most of the big players filed a lot of patents, but they were specific to their core industry and not looking for it. The more, the more foundational patents, not necessarily foundational, but the more foundational patents happen to have been filed by people who don't belong to the club. They're not Wall Street banks. They're not Silicon Valley uh, funded entities. They're guys, individuals who are, you know, either not respected, not known or um, attacked openly. So it should be interesting going forward. And then there's also the exchanges. The founders of exchanges um, have had to have some decent patents. Winklevoss Twins, Je from Gemini, uh, Coinbase, who just hired the most, allegedly the most prolific uh, patent portfolio prosecutor in the banking space. Ariana, I think is the name. Ariana Wood, I think is the name, I'm not sure. They hired her to build up their patent portfolio. But in general, most of the foundational type stuff was 2013, 14, and 15. And so now it is too late to get the ground level. You have to think of something new. And I'll cl close on that space, on that point, but I'm anxious to share the new stuff you're working on. It is really fantastic, and it goes way outside the that space. You know, just think chat GPT is just wonderful. Interesting. All right. Well, looking for things. Um, remember to do your own research. Apparently, I had a... Uh a uh, inaccurate fact in there or a assumption in there. So you guys do your own research and have a very good day. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you.